Thank you all for joining us. We've had really good attendance at our webinars so far. And for those of you uh, who might wonder, we are recording this tonight. And the recordings eventually will be available via the WNPS.org website. But don't look for them right away because it's going to take a few technical solutions to get them posted. Hi, Jan Bird. Hi, Yanka Hobbs. Hi, Sharon Rodman. So we're at about our half our expected count. We'll give it a couple more minutes. For those of you just joining us, welcome. We're giving everybody a few minutes to enter the room. We have a large crowd expected tonight. So while people are joining us, um, a couple of housekeeping details. You can use either the chat button or the Q&A button to ask questions. We'll be going through the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but we do, we do, the chat does stay available so we can go back and get your questions. Um, this is the, I think this is the eighth webinar we've done in the Native Plant Appreciation Month group of webinars that we put together to make up for the fact that we couldn't do activities and events, field trips, garden tours during Native Plant Appreciation Month. And Native Plant Appreciation Month goes through the whole end of the month. And I believe there's about six more presentations available as webinars after this one. So look on the WNPS.org homepage and they're listed at the bottom. Scroll down to get to the calendar and you'll see them along with um, access to the links to register. So thank you all again for registering tonight and for joining us. Um, Denise, what do you think? We're at about 160. I think we've waited five minutes. People could join us. The numbers will increase. We should get started. Welcome, everyone. We should get started. Okay, great. So you can go ahead and unshare your screen. And I'd like to introduce our first gardener, Clay Antio, MS, PhD, is a horticulturist and botanist who enthusiastically combines these disciplines to offer unique abilities and perspectives in restoration, environmental education, and science communication. He's a longtime instructor and advisor with the University of Washington's Professional and Continuing Education Certificate Program in Wetland Science and Management. At WNPS, he's a fellow, past president, and previous chapter chair of the Washington Native Plant Society. He's also past president of the Northwest Chapter of the Society of Ecological Restoration and a former member of the board of directors and the Washington of the Washington Trails Association. So Clay, please go ahead and share your screen and welcome and thank you. 
Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, can you all hear me there? Yes. Great. Well, um, I'm uh, delighted to be a presenter tonight, and I thank uh, Elizabeth and Denise for making this possible. I think this is a great way to bring the Native Plant Society into the 21st century, even if by force. It's uh, just a great opportunity. Uh, and I'm delighted to see so many folks, so many familiar names that are attending tonight. So welcome everybody and thank you for your interest in this webinar. I'm particularly excited tonight to talk about one of my passions, which is um, gardening and uh, in particular gardening in my um, home space. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the garden that um, I and then uh, later with uh, my wife, uh, we've developed over about 30 years and uh, I hope you will find this an intriguing and um, motivational presentation. So first off, I'd like to start with um, a brief description of the garden, uh, a little bit of uh, background on it. And um, I'll tell you first that the, the garden is in the Whittier Heights neighborhood of Northwest Seattle, in the state of Washington, USA. Uh, I'll show you a map of that location in just a moment. The garden is a uh, long-term undertaking. I purchased this property in 1991. That was 29 years ago, and I began gardening immediately upon it. One of the reasons I bought the property was that it was such an excellent potential garden site, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, the um, garden was uh, literally created from scratch. Uh, the soils had been poorly stewarded over time. There were basically no plants here, just some junipers and uh, lilac and a rose bush and really bad turf. <clears throat> so everything from um, healthy soils to diverse plants to the circulation system, the gathering spaces in the garden and the, ha the hardscape were constructed entirely from scratch. Uh, this garden is unique in that it's really a public space. Uh, my property occupies a corner lot in a highly densified area of the city of Seattle. Uh, and so um, there are a lot of people that um, walk through my garden, essentially, on the public sidewalks and pass by on public streets. And so it has a uh, sort of a, a public space aspect to it, which is one of the things that my wife and I love about the garden, is that it contributes to the community in which we live. The garden has evolved over time. So uh, 29 years ago, it was a very hot, sunny, and dry place. And over time, um, due to the planting of shrubs and trees, uh, it has evolved to a cool, shady, and dry environment. So still dry, but now cooler and shadier. And uh, as you know out there, the gardeners out there will know, dry shade is a challenging garden situation, uh, one that I've tried to embrace a little bit here uh, as the garden has evolved. The garden has also been transformative. Um, when I purchased the property, it was basically a habitat wasteland, just turf. Um, and it's evolved to a habitat of abundance. Um, we have counted in the last two years, 35 species of birds that have visited the garden, countless invertebrates, um, particularly bees, wasps, and spiders. Uh, we have a share of mammals here, including healthy squirrel populations, or routine visitors such as possum and raccoon, um, mole and rat, and uh, occasionally coyotes will pass by. So uh, the place has changed um, substantially in uh, the 29 years that I've been gardening here. And the garden is diverse. It's notable for uh, a wide array of plant life. And in particular, there's over 1,100 different taxa growing on this uh, urban property, plus 150 cultivated varieties and species of hosta and about 50 species and varieties of epimedium. And um, what's unique about this garden, in my opinion, is that it includes um, native plants. And I'm not a plant snob, so I grow uh, things that are common native to the Pacific Northwest and that are also unusual and then um, many rare species present here and I'll talk about um, how I use those um, native plants in just a moment. That gives you a little bit of a background in terms of what the uh, garden has evolved from. 
Uh, this is where the garden is located. So if you know the city of Seattle, you'll be familiar with the uh, city park Green Lake here. So we're just northwest of Green Lake, um, north of downtown Seattle, Whittier Heights neighborhood, which is between the Crown Hill neighborhood and um, Ballard. Most people know where Ballard is. Um, I'm going to show you this a very grainy picture of the property as it was in 1990. So this is just before I purchased the property. And um, you can get an idea of what this property looked like at that time. So here's the house. It sits on two and a quarter lots. It's way back on the west side of the properties. And uh, there's a huge front yard, uh, which was grass at the time I purchased the property. There were a few junipers on this side of the property and a lilac bush here and a rose bush here. That's pretty much it. So since 1991, um, uh, the garden has evolved, as I mentioned, and this is what it looked like um, in 2007. You see that uh, a lot of progress has been made, many garden beds formed, circulation established, and then this is what it looked like last year. Uh, now with um, maturing trees and shrubs, uh, and now um, mostly a shady um, dry garden, as I've mentioned. And you can see that it's um, located on a, an intersection here. So this is a main arterial through Whittier Heights, and then this is a residential street. Um, a very busily traveled um, uh, through fair, and uh, one that's also trafficked a lot by pedestrians that are using the sidewalks there. So a couple of perspectives of the garden. Here it is looking along that main arterial and looking west. Uh, these uh, trees here are Turkish filberts, which were um, provided by the city of Seattle. And so I garden in this city space as well as um, uh, a little bit of city space on this side. The next image shows you uh, a view from uh, the north looking to the south along that residential street. Um, a major tree established here, a hybrid involving Acer truncatum and Acer platinoides. Um, and then the interior of the garden is um, quite diverse. We actually have a vegetable garden um, off to the right in this image, um, but we have a, a path system which enables us to uh, maintain the garden as, also, as well as enjoy it. Um, the main pathway system is paved with these hazelnut shells, uh, which we find a delightful paving material, a long lasting and a, a waste product from the largest hazelnut orchard in the state, Holmquist Orchards. They sell those as a a product from their uh, processing hazelnuts. Um, you'll also notice in this image, uh, we provide some uh, features for wildlife. Here's a water feature. That's one thing that we do need to provide. It's a dry space. Um, uh, we use this for birds. The birds use it a lot. And we also have a couple of feeding stations for birds. And then I have a sort of a bowels of the garden, a compost area that's uh, just off to the right as well. So, I just want to emphasize that this is not a native plant garden. Rather, it's a garden with native plants. Uh, the native plants that I use in this garden commingle freely with the non-native species that also make it into the garden. And so this uh, image here shows you an example of that. Here's our native sword fern, one of our most, um, uh, um, uh, I guess, beloved performers in the garden. It's really an excellent, uh, plant for the Pacific Northwest, well adapted and evergreen, just excellent. I use a lot of it in our garden. And here it's combining with the uh, European Lathyrus vernus, the spring sweet pea. So I'm just going to go through sort of some of the highlights of the native species that are present in the garden and um, just illustrate a few of those uh, notable species. And so here's a list of sort of uh, some exceptional uh, specimens of native trees that are present in the garden. So we have noble fir, we have the fourth native maple in the Pacific Northwest in our garden, which I'm proud of. Most people think that there are just three native maples in the Northwest, but there are actually four. A Sir Grandi Dentatum, the big tooth maple. Got two forms of Alaska yellow cedar, large incense cedar. Um, I've got dwarf forms of various native uh, tree and shrub species here because it's a small urban landscape. I needed to consider ultimate size. And so dwarf forms work very well for us. And then some other uh, interesting things that I'll show you here in some images. So one of the more notable plants in our garden is the brewer's weeping spruce here on the right in our garden. You'll notice it's growing here with, on the right, um, Cornus sessilis from Northern California, uh, one of the Cornells. 
our native um, North American Cornell. And then also a nice patch of Melica smithi, a native grass, the onion grass, um, that you find throughout the state in uh, shady forested conditions. This uh, Brewer's Weeping Spruce has been in the garden about uh, 25 years, uh, and it's uh, thought to be the largest Brewer's Spruce in the city of Seattle. It actually made it into um, Arthur Lee Jacobson's book, uh, Trees of Seattle, as that notable specimen. This species is noted for its um, drooping, pendulous uh, branchlets, and here's an image of it in its native environment, uh, northern uh, California, the Siskiyou Mountains of Oregon and California. Um, really a beautiful plant. My specimen, not yet fully developing those pendulous branchlets, but ultimately getting there. I've got the blue form of Douglas fir, it's called Hess, cultivated variety here, showing you the female cones from this year, brightly uh, colorful, they're bracts there, and then these are the male cones. Uh, that's been actually a very attractive plant, uh, does well if you grow it in dry, sunny conditions. And um, I have two forms of our Western red cedar. Now, uh, this is a dwarf form that was selected by Mike Lee, who owned um, uh, formerly the Colvos Creek Nursery. A beautiful dwarf form um, with these um, thick, uh, substantive dark green um, leaves. A uh, very attractive thing. And so this plant has been in the garden for about 20 years and is only about 12 feet tall. Very attractive plant. In terms of native shrubs, I've got some interesting things uh, that are growing here. I'll show you a couple of these in images, but uh, a notable mountain mahogany, Cerakocarpus latifolius. It's been in the garden for uh, nearly the 29 years it's uh, been around. I showed you Cornicessalus earlier. I have a good collection of mahonias, including uh, the Californian and Oregon, uh, uh, Oregon grapes. So the Nevin Oregon grape, for example, and the California Oregon grape grow well in my garden. The Rocky Mountain nine bark. A uh, nice patch of Rosa gymnocarpa, the naked hip rose, uh, a dwarf form of California bay laurel. I'll get to that in just a moment. One of my favorite shrubs, which I'll illustrate, is Viburnum ellipticum, the oval leaved Viburnum. So, one of the rarest plants that I grow in my garden is Ceanothus hirstiorum, which is extreme, extremely rare, known from just a single location in California. And I'll just say that my definition of native is fairly broad in this case, including um, portions of California, Oregon, uh, and other uh, nearby locations like Idaho. Um, so this particular one has been uh, very successful in my garden. It loves the dry shade. It forms a, 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 a distinctly prostrate ground cover, evergreen, and uh, with these attractive blue flowers. And it's in flower right now. A very successful, desirable dry shade tolerant ground cover. Here's the California Oregon grape, good in flower about two weeks ago. It has an interesting sort of bluish dull foliage which is attractive. Uh, this is a real performer in my garden. Uh, it's um, one of the first plants to flower uh, in the year after the turn of the year, uh, lob gooseberry. Um, you find it on the east side of the Cascades in Washington, but also on the west sides in the Olympic Peninsula here. It has these very tiny red and white flowers that are just uh, um, really quite remarkable. Um, very nice plant, I like it. Uh, and then this very rarely cultivated dwarf form of the California bay laurel. For those of you that know the bay laurel, you'll understand that this gets to be a very large tree, 80 to 100 feet or more, um, where it grows in California, Oregon but there's a dwarf form, the chaparral form of this species that I cultivate in my garden and also a very cherished form for its very slow growth. Um, it's evergreen, has these interesting yellow flowers. This was flowering a month ago, it's done now. Uh, and exceedingly drought tolerant, just a great plant. And then uh, one of my favorite shrubs, the viburnum ellipticum, the oval leaved viburnum uh, native to Washington and points south. These two shrubs right here uh, are my mature specimens. Uh, they are uh, attractive in all seasons. They produce abundant uh, flowers that are attractive to insects and they produce fruit, which attracts a lot of bird life to our garden. Really a nice drought tolerant, attractive shrub that should be used a lot more. And then some native herbs. Um, we have tall bugbane, um, which is extremely rare in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm growing Clintonia andrusiana from the redwood country of California. It's actually gonna flower for the first time this year. I'm very excited. A few other interesting things I'll illustrate here in a moment. So here's Actea elata, the um, tall bugbane. This is a rare plant. 
uh, in Washington, known from just a handful of locations uh, in the world. And I was fortunate to find this uh, uh, in the nursery trade. Um, and uh, I'm growing it here just to see what it does. And it thrives in my garden in the dry shade where you find it in nature in Washington. Um, early in the development of my garden, I was uh, collecting seed and propagating my own plants. I collected some seed of this species, the large flowered colomia from the Quimper Peninsula, south of Port Townsend, and just scattered in the garden and you just loved it here, uh, the hot dry conditions. So this plant continues to persist to this day. It seeds itself gently around the garden and it produces um, these beautiful salmon colored flowers, um, which um, Sarah Gage, who was a participant tonight, pointed out to me some years ago, the uh, curiously blue um, anthers of this species. A very interesting plant that way. This is an annual, I hadn't mentioned that, and so it's somewhat unusual to be cultivating a native annual, but this one uh, thrives in cultivation. It's really good for most of the summer. Great insect plant. We've got patches of Mayanthemum racemosum, the large false Solomon seal there in the upper right, as well as a establishing, slowly, patch of Erythronium oregonum, the giant fawn lily. Uh, I love my patch of the variegated form of Pacific water leaf. Big patch of this. Um, it's very cheerful um, as the winter is ending and it's emerging from the ground. A beautiful bright patch of uh, white and light green uh, in my garden. The rare Trillium curabayashii from the Siskiyou Mountains, also now established in my garden, and this is slowly increasing in time. These remarkable purple tepals um, and uh, strikingly mottled foliage along the lines of Trillium sessile, if you cultivate that one, that's commonly seen in the trade. But uh, excited to have this one also very rarely encountered in the nursery trade. And then just among our, our best performers, um, there are natives uh, that are truly among the best plants in our garden. And I would mention a few of them here in this list, and then I'll illustrate uh, these to you. You know, I tried for a number of years to get a, a wild ginger established in the garden, Asarum caudatum. And uh, they never really took until I established the green form. There's two forms, the red flowered form here and the green flowered form. And uh, what I've noticed is that it's the green flowered form that is very vigorous and robust and just looking great through the year. Um, there's very little red flowered um, wild ginger in my garden. So here, these images show you uh, patches of that here, uh, commingling with an epimedium uh, here, commingling with that Lathyrus vernus again, colchicum, epimediums, um, various bulbs in the lily family and so forth. It's one of the uh, most uh, rewarding ground covers that I grow. It's evergreen, tolerant of dry shade, no insect or disease pests, um, easy to manage, just looks great all year long. Carex hendersoni has also been a, a surprise. A beautiful native sedge with a clump habit, um, broad evergreen leaves. It seeds itself gently around the garden, um, finds its suitable locations and uh, really makes a nice uh, um, um, uh, ground cover when it seeds densely. Uh, otherwise, you find it as isolated evergreen individuals. Very rewarding, uh, low maintenance plant. And then here's a group of plants that everybody should know, everybody who gardens in the Pacific Northwest. This is a group of iris hybrids, hybrids that involve Northwest native species called the Pacific Coast hybrids. And uh, it's truly a remarkable group because literally uh, comes in every color of the rainbow from near black to pure white and everything in between. Uh, and the forms that I grow, and I have about um, seven or eight of these different forms. There's this remarkable blue form. Uh, these, um, which were raised actually by a local hybridizer, this nice um, pure clean yellow form. Uh, and then a white form called Canyon Snow, pure white, very excellent. These are drought tolerant, shade tolerant plants, uh, look good all year round. Most of them are evergreen or semi evergreen, uh, easy to manage, just really excellent garden subjects. And I use a lot of them in this garden. Now, uh, that's uh, sort of an overview of some of the highlights in terms of native plants, but there are challenges ahead uh, for a garden like this, as you might suspect. The garden continues to evolve to a shadier condition. Um, and so um, considering its origins in hot, sunny conditions, it's been 
a challenge to sort of keep up with the evolving shade. Uh, that's a challenge though, and I'm up for it. Uh, my wife and I are constantly looking at how to manage the garden so that we can continue to support a diversity of plant and animal life here. Um, our, our garden managers are getting older. That's uh, something that we need to consider. Um, a garden like this is not everybody's cup of tea, keeps me and my wife in shape, um, but uh, it's not everybody's uh, cup of tea as I managed and uh, not everybody would be up for a task in managing a garden like this. The property was recently upzoned by the city of Seattle, uh, which has increased um, pressure for redevelopment. There used to be a lot of pressure for redevelopment, but now it's even more intense. A developer recently purchased an entire block uh, nearby uh, and is going to be raising all the single family residential buildings there and constructing multifamily. So uh, this property is increasingly pressured um, for redevelopment. And so uh, the great challenge ahead for my wife and I um, is how do you preserve this garden's future after an investment of 30 years uh, and some remarkable diversity uh, and rarity uh, and community um, um, presence um, how do you preserve that garden's future as uh, things change here rapidly on the social context? So I'm going to wrap up my presentation. Um, I'm uh, delighted to answer any questions that folks have. And if uh, you would like to visit the garden, um, feel welcome to email me at this email address, and I'll be happy to uh, share the location. And uh, if I'm around, I'll give you a personalized tour. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Clay. That was fascinating, and I might be taking you up on that tour invitation. Um, I, we have a couple of questions, but we'll be getting to the questions at the end of everybody's presentation. So you can unshare your screen, and I'd like to introduce our next gardener, Julia Bent. Julia told me that she became interested in native plants when she lived in the Colorado mountains in the early 1970s and took a field class in alpine plant ident identification. After moving to Washington, she eventually joined WNPS and started going on field trips and became involved in working at the sun table at the plant sales, uh, something she's done for over 20 years, or almost 20 years, sorry. She was on the WNPS board briefly as um, organizer of field trips for the Central Puget Sound chapter and she continues to enjoy botanizing on both day and backpacking trips to the mountains. Whenever possible, she tries to make plant lists and post them on the WNPS website, or plant list on the website. Um, so let me just put in a little plug for an upcoming, uh, another webinar. You can supercharge your plant ID skills with plant lists uh, Saturday at 10 o'clock. Um, so that's on the calendar, and if you're interested, you can um, register that way. So let me uh, turn it over to Julia. Julia, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and share your screen. Is that working? That's working. Looks great. That's the main one. Well, it doesn't look great. It looks pretty sick, but um, I don't, my, I'm not very skilled at these presentations, so it's not as well put together as Clay's, but um, I'm going to talk about a rain garden that I had put in when I purchased this derelict property in Lake Forest Park in February of 2010. And this isn't, doesn't look very promising as a place to buy, I appreciate. Um, I just want to point out that in the foreground, in front of the garage and behind that um, barrier, is where the rain garden ended up going. The house was torn down. It was infested with rats and mold. And I had a completely new home rebuilt on the property. So um, this is a year later. Uh, the house is not quite finished, but it's on its way. And this is the area where I put in the rain garden. And you can see uh, to the right that there's sort of a trench that goes, connects the right to the left. And this is an area where I had a bridge put in to put over it, which you'll see later. So the, the uh, soil that I'm working with here is compacted construction soil. Um, it's 
it's not very good. I think it was bulldozed in when the previous house was made. And it's just um, pretty rotten construction fill. And this gives you a close up of um, what we we're dealing with. It just basically is because I had big machines on, on site anyway to uh, work on construction of the house, I had them dig this rain garden for me with a backhoe basically. And then we dumped uh, a mixture of compost and sand, about 50 50, to fill in the rain garden. And you can see that here's the start, and then it got moved around as was needed to fill in the rain garden. You can see one of the big buckets in the foreground that they had to use um, when they were digging. And I had some visitors before everything was done. And this is a coyote pup. And the pup is curled up in a compost pile, which is putting out lots of nice heat. And so it's very happy. Um, there were four pups that were involved. I never did see the mom. They were born in the woods behind the house and they would come up and sleep in the compost and play in the yard and came into the garage at one point and were quite friendly as pups, but as they matured, they became more wary. And then I stopped seeing any of them except for one, I think I saw at one point when it was a sub-adult. Uh, as you can see, the coat on this pup looks awful. Unfortunately, it has scabies, um, which all the pups had. So they spent a lot of time scratching too. So here's the house, um, more or less finished. And in the foreground, you can see the rain garden. Um, there are a couple of pathetic little plants in it. And um, you can also see the, in the, along the house, you can see the rocky areas where the drain pipes come in. The purpose behind this was to uh, take all the water from the roof on this side of the house and from this side of the garage and put them into drain pipes that emptied into the rain garden. Subsequently, I used, I dug a trench at the very left hand side of the photo and managed to route the, all the rainwater from the other side of the roof into the rain garden as well. So this is um, how we did it initially, was to um, just pile some rocks around here, hoping that these rocks would uh, act as a barrier um, and slow the input of water from the roof when it rained, which didn't work very well. It ended up with rocks scattered everywhere. This is another view of it looking from the driveway. In the background, you can see a uh, area with a lot of gravel in it, and that's where it's supposed to be the overflow for the rain garden, which was kind of a joke because this rain garden never even came close to ever filling. Um, even in the biggest storm, it barely goes under the bridge, which you can see here has been installed to the front door. So the, the, there's a big drain pipe to your right, and it moves under the bridge, <clears throat> over, and goes just a couple of feet, and that's as far as it's ever gone. So basically, unfortunately, this turns out to be quite a dry garden, not less of a rain garden than you might have thought. But thinking that it was going to be nice and wet, I put in some blueberry bushes um, down in that end, which has never seen water in the rain garden ever. Um, but uh, the blueberry bush in the foreground has grown and produced the rest of kind of withered away because it's just so dry back there. And these are three little mountain hemlocks that I put in. You can see them in the previous photo, I guess a couple on the left there. And I put these in. Um, way too close together, of course, but you know, that's what we all do, I guess. And uh, I didn't know what would happen with them, but I thought, well, let's see what happens. The two in the background I purchased, the one in the foreground was a gift to me from Dick Olmsted, who's at the U, he's the professor, the curator there, professor at the U, curator of the herbarium. This is what they look like now, actually looking from the other side. So in 10 years, they've grown that much. Actually, probably only nine years. I didn't get these in initially. And to the right, you can see a Paxistema uh, plant, a shrub, which you can see in the lower portion there. I had actually purchased 10 of those, and a few of them did well. I moved several down to my forest. I also have a half acre of forest. And they didn't do very well down there because of the mountain beaver. But up here on the right, you can see it's quite vigorous. And this is toward the driveway area. I put in a vine maple in the foreground. 
And I also put in quite a bit of Carex of Nupta in the background. That didn't do very well either there or on the other side of the bridge. Once it grew up, it would then have a lot of dead leaves. It did reseed itself a little bit, but it ended up looking kind of rotten. And I ended up removing most of it. Um, this area now has completely different plants in it, which you'll see toward the end of the presentation. But you can see that there's a little bit of water that's come in um, at the base there, so it's nice and moist. And it did travel into the bridge to the left, but it never went very far. And it goes even less now. It barely gets to the bridge before it gets absorbed. And this is that tree uh, this year. Uh, actually, this morning I took this photo. So it's not fully leafed out yet, but you can see how well it's grown in the time it's been in. And this is a, a Malus fusa, which is uh, considered an Indian plum. And this was early on, obviously. And you can see the little mountain hemlocks in the background on the left and some of the carex and a couple of little plants that I put in along the way. So this is probably 2012, I believe. So we hadn't gotten too far at this point. And you see in the background that you can see the fir trees um, kind of at the edge of, behind the back edge of the rain of the rain garden. You can see that there are quite a few fir trees there. They're dug firs. And it's their shade that shades out the back of that, of the rain garden. And here it is now. This is, as of today, this is the Melis fusa, the Indian plum, um, which is a, basically a native crab apple. And in the foreground, you can also see a fern that's growing. And this is a male fern, Dryopteris felix mass. And it was given to me by Jim Demmel. There's a, uh, a similar one on the other side of the boardwalk there. And he grew it from spores that he collected somewhere in the mountains. And it has just absolutely taken off. I'm going to have to divide it. Uh, if someone wants some, let me know. Um, and in the background on the left, you see you can't see those fir trees anymore. There seems to be something in the way. And oh, anyway, before we get to that, you can see here that this was a couple of years ago, but you can see how big the vine maple on the right and the Indian plum on the left have gotten along with the ferns and a little bit of everything else. And then in front of the vine maple, you see an iris and that's a native iris. I think it's native to Oregon. Iris oregana, I believe. And in the background, there's quite a, you see a big um, iracium maximum, or I guess you call it cow parsnip, and it's looking pretty maximum there. And another plant that I used in there quite a bit initially was lupin, which you can see here in the foreground. I put in one plant and it spread all over the place very happily. And this was taken a couple of years ago, and then it died out, and I have absolutely no idea why. Um, I've got a couple of little sprouts coming up this year. It's sort of doing whatever it wants. And then in the background, I wanted to show you, this is a um, madrona tree that started from seeds that were deposited by the crows. And so it's growing on the edge of the rain garden. To your right, you can see a smaller one. It's growing right smack dab in the middle of the rain garden, which is supposed to be a moist area, but it doesn't seem to care. It's not very moist and um, it's growing quite nicely. And in fact, at some times during the summer, this grain garden is so dry, I actually have to water it, which is sort of pathetic, but that's the way it goes. So as of now, I've put in one or two little plants of Dicentra formosa, and you can see what it did. It just took off completely. This was taken today, and in the background, you can see the fern, the male fern, that's growing quite exuberantly all on its own. You can see on the right, um, on the right border, there's a little bit of lupin coming back. So that's some of the remnant new lupin. It's also a little bit of the carex of nupta in the foreground. It's kind of like you just have to let things do what they want to do often. Under the Dicentra formosa, you can see there in the lower left, there's a deer fern that's been buried, poor thing. Um, but it does well other times of the year. And this is, and uh, I'm blanking on the name, but it's in the same family as the Dicentra formosa. And I just put in one plant a couple of years ago and it has just exploded and taken off, um, doing very, very well at the back of the rain garden in a very dry area near where the blueberry bushes are. And this is the carrot, the um, iris that I mentioned. And that's this year, it's not in bloom, but you saw the previous photo that it was in bloom. 
And up on, above it on the left, you can see the other uh, male fern, Dryopteris felix mass. And this is what's supposed to be growing in rain gardens, is skunk cabbage. And I put this in very early on, and it's, you, unfortunately, some of the spades are obstructed right now by the leaves, but it now has multiple flowers on it and um, is doing very, very well. And it's in the wettest part of the rain garden, which is where really it belongs. And here you can see a photo that was taken, I think, two years ago along the house. I put this um, maidenhair fern on the lower left. I borrowed just a little bit from a friend of mine and have been dividing it and planting it elsewhere in the garden ever since. It's done really well. Basically, the things that have done the best um, are the ferns. I've got deer fern and sword fern and uh, the, the dryopteris and also the maidenhair fern. And then you can see some large leaves in the middle foreground, and that's Damara. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's something that Dick Old, um, Olmsted gave me as well. And I find it, um, it flowers and then the leaves come up. They get really big, um, so it's really fun. So that's, I think, all I have um, to show you. But just wanted to give you some idea of how quickly you can transform from you know, bare construction soil with really nothing going for it. Again, this was made easier for me because it was all part of the construction of the house. So I had the um, people on site to do the work for me, the, the shoveling work, um, and to spread the compost when I first filled it. Um, I do want to caution you about some of the plants that might be used, and I made these up. Um, these are plants that I have put one or two plants in and then spent years trying to get rid of because they just absolutely will take over. Uh, fireweed likes to do that. It came in very early and I ended up rooting through all the compost to try and extirpate it, digging roots out and did manage to get it out. The mimulus or Erythranthri cutata has been, was a real trial. It took over a whole part of it and you know, I don't want just to have monocultures in it. I'd like to have bunches of things. So I've gotten it out. The Pedicytes frigidus, it's very nice. It likes the wet, but um, it took over too. I'm still finding some of that. The Stachys coolii is impossible to get rid of, so I just try and keep it under control. It is very pretty. It loves the nice wet parts of the rain garden where the uh, other main <clears throat> other main drain pipe comes in, um, but I've given up trying to get rid of it, but I just try and keep it under control. Uh, two plants that I have put in, each of them, uh, I put in one plant only, and the Sedalcia hendersonii and the Boykinia intermedia, and the latter I also got from Dick Olmsted. They have spread and just taken over a whole area, um, and I've just decided that's just fine. They can stay there. And I also put in a symphotrichium, and which is an aster, or formerly an aster, and it does provide some fall color because, and it's taken over, you know, one plant is just taken over an enormous area as well. So that's pretty much all I have to report on. I'm not sure I've used all my time, but um, that'll give more time for questions at the end. And um, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you, That's, Julia. I just love the, um, I really love the self-seeded madronas. People are very jealous of this tree is 15 feet tall now, and it's only about seven, eight years old. Okay. It's inspiring. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions, and we'll get to those after our next gardener, who is Rita Moore. Rita tells me that she's always been a gardener, her parents and her sisters are also gardeners. When they moved to the Seattle area from, I believe, the East Coast in 1999, she encountered a whole new plant environment that she knew nothing about. So after settling in and retiring from the tech industry, she needed to find something to do and decided to learn about the environment. So she signed up with both the King Conservation District and WNPS for the Land Water Stewardship class and the native plant stewardship class in 2001. Since then, she's been removing ivy, like every other good steward, and other invasives, and planting native plants in her ravine and in public space. 
She also lectures on various aspects of native plants and consults with homeowners on adding native plants to their yards. Within WNPS, she's been on the CPS board, I believe, and led various committees, including the CPS plant sale. So thank you and welcome, Rita. I see you're all set to go, so please take it away. Okay. Hi, um, I'm uh, Rita Moore, and what I wanted to show you in this first slide was that even if you have very limited space, you can still grow natives. So here we have east side natives growing in a pot. Here we have a forest garden growing in a pot. And here we have a wetland growing garden growing in a pot. So even if you have very, very little space, you can still grow natives. Okay, um, I live on Mercer Island on the east side here. I live in a ravine. So the south edge of my property here is a stream and um, not too far from the lake. And this is one of the main routes on east, uh, in Mercer Way to get north and south on the island. Okay, this is the assessor's picture of the original house and it looks pretty wild. The stream is down in here. This is, so this is mostly the south side, and this direction is west, this direction is east. So when I purchased the house, um, it was half painted. Uh, so this is the original color, it changes color in the next pictures. A lot of ivy growing on trees, on the ground. The whole backyard was landscaped with sawdust. That's, this is all sawdust. Now, notice this gate, keep this gate in mind because it's gonna show up in quite a few more pictures. So the front of the house, we, here we have ivy, uh, and we have a meadow here that mostly has ivy and grass, other grasses and invasive plants. I, uh, cannot show you the same picture because things have grown so much you can no longer see the house from some of these places. So here's one taken from above and you can see I've cleared this hillside and I've started putting in ferns. Uh, the wet meadow is down here and the stream runs along this edge of the wet meadow and runs in this direction. Uh, probably hundreds of ferns uh, were salvaged. And here you can see I've started to lay out some paths because there was, there was no organization whatsoever on this property. So I have a path now to the back gate and I have a path down to the deck. And these are all natives, small at this point in time, except for the things that are big, like we have really, really big dug firs and western red cedars and hemlocks on the property. Uh, one of the dug firs over in here, I had some arborists working on it and it's over 200 feet tall. So they're second growth uh, trees, maybe 140 years old. And here you can, this, here's the gate back here and you can see how this area has now changed from almost all sawdust to starting with the start of having native plants in here. So this is the uh, back entry to the house. This is my uh, kitchen sink right here. So my view is out into this area and these are some of the plants now that have filled in a bit, you can see we have vine maple, I have a vine maple here. I have deer ferns in this area, a lot of fringe cup growing in and false Solomon seal, you really can't see it, but this is false Solomon seal here. And there's some false Solomon seal in here. And this whole area that when you saw the last time was just some ferns is now all shrubs. So I've been gardening here. We bought the house in 1999. 
and I became a native plant steward in 2001 and also a land water steward from King Conservation, Conservation District in the same year. So uh, it's a lot of change. Uh, I've tried to make it look like it's natural. So one of the things, more things, I have snowberry growing in here. Here you can see how the vine maple has grown up nicely. I have bleeding heart over here. I've got columbine in this section and in this section, more bleeding heart in here. And you can see some of the large trees in this area. And here are some of the wildlife. I had a little saucer basically for under plants and I have ducks that came to it. Unfortunately, my one neighbor got beagles and let them loose and I know we no longer have a pair, two pair, we used to have two pairs of mallards in the neighborhood that every spring would uh, hatch some eggs and baby mallards, but we don't have those anymore. And then the ducks weren't the only one who used the water, even my cats used the water. So this is the view, this out of my kitchen window. This is the first part of the garden that I started putting in. Uh, these are different years. Here you can see some of the co co columbine and there's foam flower and heuchera in here. And over here is salal. There's a pretty, uh, originally a hazel in here. More deep, more ferns. Sword ferns are a real basis, a basic plant in my, in my planting plan. They're all over the place and they do really well. Here you can see the hazel coming in here, and there's that back gate again that I remembered that I reminded you to sort of keep in mind. And the, the violets are in here. I haven't watered this area in the past year, so the violets have been decreasing. So I'm decided that this summer I'm just going to some water a little more than I usually do, which is not at all, and see if I can get these violets to grow back to this nice fullness that you see in this picture here. Again, this is the same picture. I've got columbine growing over here, sword ferns, uh, more. This is my anthemum, which is, uh, can be uh, invasive, but in my garden, you know, it can sort of go pretty much where I want it to go. Because I have a shy half acre with a stream, a wet meadow, and like the, I said, the 140-year-old upland forest. So there's a lot of places for things to grow. And a lot of things, you know, move around all on their own. Every spring, and right now, miner's lettuce is all over the place. Back in here, I have some penstemon also out front. And the, another plant that's a little less common, but I've been able to grow it very successfully, are fairy bells. So I have fairy bells growing over here and some more fairy bells growing over this way. And I always remember which, don't remember which are which. One has the, the stamens below the flower and the other has the stamens above the flower. And I never remember which one I have. I always have to look it up. Here are some of the hazelnuts. I never get to eat the hazelnuts though because the blue jays and the squirrels are there as soon as they're ready. This uh, red huckleberry here is a deciduous plant and it's quite large. It was one of the few plants that was on the property when I arrived. And as you can see, it has a lot of nice red berries that are really quite good. And one of the other plants I have a lot of are the large leaf avens. A lot of people think of these as weeds, but I have tons of them planted on the other side of this gate, which is East Mercer Way, along the roadway. And cars can drive over this stuff and it still comes back. So it's green, it keeps the we other weeds from growing and it does it occasionally in other places in my garden and sometimes I remove it, but sometimes not. Here's that back gate again. This is actually this year. However, had I taken the picture today, it would have looked completely different because so much stuff in the last two weeks has just leafed out in this brilliant bright green all over the place. And you can see the myanthemum here, the uh, 
inside out flowers are over here. I have, uh, here's one of the violets you can see and the, and the fairy bells were in here. I have Solomon seal in here, sword ferns and some sword ferns here. And here you can see looking, standing back here and looking this way, you can see the um, bleeding heart. Behind the bleeding heart is um, snowberry and there's a, a vine maple in there. Back in here, you can't see it very well, but between the big dug fir and the dead uh, western red cedar, there's a really large, here, here you can see it actually, a really large evergreen huckleberry that's doing very well. I never thought that would grow there because it, it's sort of between the two trees and there's a drop off on the other side, but it's grown bigger than any of my other uh, evergreen huckleberries, which were all started from small starts. Most of the plants in this garden were either salvaged or I purchased them through the King or the Snohomish Conservation District as bare root plants uh, because it's much cheaper that way. And then of course I bought plants through the um, WNPS native plant sale. And here's a hazel that's just begin. not excuse me, a, a, a red flowering currant that's just beginning to grow a little more because we trimmed this hazel way back this year. So this, this is now beginning to grow. This red flowering currant is growing nicely now. And here you can see some of the sword ferns and I have some lighting back there and the bleeding heart and the path. My younger son and I put in the path And this is a little fellow that I have occasionally coming around. This is a native squirrel, sometimes called a chicory or a cone cutter. It's not as big as the, it's, it's not as big as the gray squirrels, which are not native. It has a little beige belly. And it has, I have a big tree right outside my bedroom window. And when it's been on that tree, you can sort of chirp at it and it chirps back to you. So if you ever find a pile of the scales from the Douglas fir cone. This little guy has been eating the seeds from the Douglas fir cone and he creates that pile of, of the scales from left over from the cone. This is also the backyard, but I've moved about 10 feet south and now I'm looking, you can see a bit of the road up here. This is East Mercer Way and there's a house across the street. Uh, I have a native roadie over here, another native roadie in here, more not blooming, but more um, bleeding heart in this area. I have a couple of non-native deciduous roadies over here and you know, various pots. This is my favorite corner actually. I used to sit, there used to be uh, uh, autumn blooming uh, plum, but one of these big non-native cedars came down uh, and tore everything out. And so since then I have to put up an umbrella to get my shade. So you can see this is the, the stairs. And just a few days ago, one of these, three of these guys were there. They so far haven't eaten much. Mostly what they're eating is fringe cup. And here's that duck from a while ago and, and a whole bunch of little baby ducklings. They aren't around, but I thought they're very nice. And this is an Encetina, one of our native salamanders. And I would really request that you don't cut your sword ferns back to the ground because these guys live in those sword ferns over the winter. And our, uh, this is, when I first saw it, I thought, Oh, that's a huge earthworm. But then, wait a minute, it's got legs. So these live in the sword ferns that are down this, in this direction, slopes down to the stream. And this is my upland forest area. And here's that gate that keeps popping up. Here you can't even see the gate. Well, maybe that's it, because this is now all plants, where before it was all that sawdust that you saw. So I have the Pacific iris growing along here. 
I have some fritillaria growing along here. Um, this is that native roadie, but it's small. Now this native roadie is probably 15 feet tall. Soars ferns along here. And as you go down, this slopes down towards the stream. And this is part of the meadow back in here. And this used to be all open, but now it's all covered in green. And where before I had a lot, a lot of dry stuff, I have a lot more moss now. Some of my, in the back behind the house, I have this, a big dug fir, the biggest one. And it has now a lot of moss on its lower, mm, not roots, but the big bits above the surf or surface. This is the deck. And in this deck over here, it was a sort of a spot, unattractive corner between the house and the deck. So I put in a vine maple and it was little and then it grew bigger. And this is what it was a year ago with the fall colors. It's just gorgeous. I love vine maples because they're not dense. Down below here, I have a, a sort of a gallery with a lot of windows and I've put a vine maple in that section. And it's really nice because even in summer, you can see through the vine maple leaves and they don't uh, really block your view. You can't really tell what this is, but this is an Alaska cedar in a in a half a wine barrel and i just like it because it sort of encloses the patio a bit then really this is only our only flat land we don't have flat land unless you go down to the meadow so here we have another section that i the only sunny spot is on the south side that's in this area and it's not terribly sunny at most i get four hours of sun so I kill a lot of sun, plant, sun plants that love sun because I try to grow them and there's not enough sun. And here's some of the miner's lettuce that comes in every spring. And now instead of these uh, lilies here, there's a large, uh, ever, uh, large mahonia. And the monk's hood keeps coming back every year. And here again, you can see the deck with the plants, there's a vine maple, there's a roadie, and there are all sorts of other things down here. I haven't listed all my plants, but there, there are tons and tons of different plants. Here's my, uh, okay, I know what this is, and I just forgot what it was, because Clay even had this. Uh, ginger, that's what it is. It's the wild ginger here, and we have some piggyback plant, with this nice tiny flowers and some lady ferns. Back here are some more uh, fringe cup. These are some Douglas irises that I have growing. And again, my ferns along here. This is a, an Indian plum and farther down here, I have a dogwood because there was this big bare spot of wall. So I now have a dogwood planted on the far side of the plant of the plant, uh, path, and it now hides that big bare wall. And here's a more detailed picture of that iris. This again is an older picture, and here you here's that dogwood that is now quite large, and this is the interim color of the house when we owned it. And here you can see the sword ferns growing along. The, the edge. There's also um, thimbleberry growing in here. And down here is the meadow. Uh, the ivy is gone now. There's, it's actually shaded more, so there, there are a lot of shrubs growing here. So you don't see this much grass and I, my few uh, steel salmon swimming upstream. And over here, we have a service berry, which is really pretty in the spring. The other thing I have in there are mock orange. And here's some of the thimbleberry. I love thimbleberry. It tastes so almost citrusy, and it doesn't have thorns. And here again is the side yard. This is my neighbor's driveway. When I moved in the house, this, none of these shrubs were here. So I have some Nutka roses. I have here some ocean spray. A little farther up the other way, I have the rhododendron oxidant tally. This really is not a 
a native Washington plant. There may be a few in very southern Washington. It grows more in Oregon and in Northern California, but it is a beautiful deciduous rhododendron. And it's not gotten too big. It was knocked down once by some branches, but I don't think it's gonna get, you know, it's, it's about five or six feet tall now and it has just absolutely gorgeous flowers on it. And here you can see the flowers on the ocean spray, sometimes call it uh, lilac. And these will hang on all winter long. And so there's some pedicides down here. This is a uh, cow parsnip. I planted some cow parsnip and they've reeded, reseeded themselves down along the meadow. And I used to have more, there used to be, the stream down here is our boundary and we have new neighbors now who wanted to see the stream. So they have cut down a lot of the shrubs because with my former neighbor, we had planted a lot of shrubs along this way that sort of, you know, hid our houses from each other. And here you can see, this is a current picture. Again, their driveway is there. So there aren't as many shrubs here as there used to be. And then this is the earlier version of what you saw back there when there were tons and tons of shrubs and you could barely see the driveway. Here they're just beginning to grow in. This is a big leaf maple. It's got a partner about 10 feet away from it. Actually here you can see this is this big leaf maple is this big one here and then this is this partner over here. They were here when we got in and there's not doing quite as well as I would like but they're still there. And this is our stream. This is East Mercer Way and there was all this riprap rock when I moved in and here you can see the this is the main pipe coming under the road and this is a storm pipe taking all the storm water from the road and dumping it here into the stream. And here you can see again the road and all this riprap rock. Here's the stream down here and I put a bench here and now this is where the, if I stand about here this is what the stream looks like. The road is back is down about here. There's a house back here and here you can barely see the stream coming through this way and these are all native shrubs and native evergreens well these are mostly not evergreens but they're more evergreens over on this slope and here again you can just barely see the bench and this is what it looked like before this is a hazel i planted there's a vine maple over there and and in this section there are a lot of i said evergreens this is all planted now i've got skunk cabbage growing in here i've got uh, tall manna grass i've got maidenhair ferns all growing in here and here you can see the, the skunk cabbage, really big leaves, and it's moved downstream a bit. Here you can see it, the, the flowers are just coming out. It's moving downstream. And this is a lot of water parsley. I've discovered that water parsley will outgrow the invasive creeping buttercup. It won't get rid of it, but it will outgrow it. So if you really have some place with a lot of creeping buttercup and it's moist, you can grow water parsley and that sort of fills it in. And here again is the bench and the hazel and trees. This is a vine maple and there are a lot of other trees and the road is right about here. So here you can see the same bench and what it was like almost 20 years ago and what it's like today. Again, these are some old, this is an old picture looking, I'm now standing uh, much farther east. The road is up here and there's, you can barely make out the stream. It's coming through this meadow. There's almost nothing growing in this meadow uh, at this point in time, except invasives, ivy, creeping buttercup, non-native grasses. And again here, there are no shrubs along here. And this is a, not a current picture, but you can still see how it's beginning to fill in and filling in now. I cannot take a picture of the house from this point anymore because they're all shrubs growing in this area. 
this is uh, the stream again. This is my properties over here to the left. This is my neighbor on the left. This is my neighbor's house on the right. And this is what the stream looked like when we moved in. It was large rocks with some blackberry on it. And people used to come around the corner on the circle and sort of drive over it because they could never see, in the edge of, see the edge of it. Here's how it was a few years ago. You can see these are red alders that came in. There were five that came in. I took out two and left three. And then when I wasn't there at one point, my neighbor over here, no, not my current neighbor, took out two more. So we don't have all of these uh, red alders growing now, but they were wonderful volunteers. But there are duck firs growing under here to replace it. And when I moved in, all of this was just sort of bare hillside. This is again the other side of the stream. There's all sorts of plants growing in here now. And you can, this in the, even, in the winter, it's not very green. This is the circle, because you come up my street, you go around the circle and you go back to the street. When I moved in, it was either nothing or uh, uh, ivy and growing on things. And then here you can see how the house is easily seen from this is the front of the little circle. And you can clearly see my tree, my house. And this is this big stump over here, a little more grown in. This is Indian plum, ocean spray, something else I can't remember, all growing in this area. Oh, and there's a lot of uh, honeysuckle also. You can see the, again the circle very low, very open. Now it has snowberry, there are asters, Indian plum, and we have a really dying, almost dead, that I've got to take down a red alder before it falls. But in case you don't know what causes these long holes and all this sawdust at the bottom, it's our friend, the pileated woodpecker. And we created this bench, my neighbor and I, and this bench no longer exists. They managed to take it apart. Here again is the circle, looking towards my neighbor on the, le on the left. This is my house looking, following this direction. And now you can see from this island, you really can't see my house. I have orange trumpet honeysuckle. This actually was growing across the street, and I took some cuttings from it naturally across the street, and I planted it, so I have a lot of this now. Mock orange is a beautiful plant. It needs a little more sun sometimes than I have, but this is the native mock orange. It's a deciduous plant. It is absolutely gorgeous, totally underutilized, and people should use more of this. Of course, the red elderberry, nice, fast growing, doesn't live all that long. And then here is the center island, and here's the house on the left. And here's what it used to look like. So you can see there are tons of plants, all natives that I've put in here. And now I have you know, a lot of privacy. The front yard, how am I doing on time here, Elizabeth? Am I running short? But, no, you're uh, doing fine, Rita. Okay, so most of the non-natives have been removed here. Uh, and here I've planted in mostly natives. I did put in here uh, witch hazel because I wanted some winter color and I have some hellebores in here. But the, the rest of these are basically all natives, ferns, uh, evergreen huckleberry. Uh, this is not native, but that was there. And this was an old ray, uh, railroad ties that rotted from the inside, so I have a now nice stone fence. This was again an old picture with the whole yard was azaleas, not azaleas, rhododendron, and nothing but rhododendron basically, and roses that didn't get any sun and look awful, and some apple trees that had bugs. I took those things out and moved them. It had one native plant, a red flowering currant, with beautiful flowers. Unfortunately, this thing, when it, it was big, it got real big, it just up and died on me. 
Here's another picture of looking from the top stairs. That's the neighbor's house. So this is sort of all native, mostly native plants in here now. Um, I have camas, checker mallow, lupins, columbine. And this is a more current view. I've since put in stairs because this is a really big dug fir and all it did was drop pine cones. And one of those days I was just gonna roll down this slope on all those pine cones. So now I have stairs in there. And here you can see the bit of the road out there. And again, this is area that didn't have much growing. And today, if I were to take this picture today, this was only a, a week or so ago, all these are leafed out now. It's absolutely beautiful. This is the inside out plant, the Vancouveria hexandra. Um, it grows very well in dry shade. It doesn't say that, but it does grow very well in dry shade. Um, this is the section against the, cur the street, the frontage. So you can see the plants in here, and here I've put in the new wall. This is, these are non-natives. And here you can see I've added all native. Now this dug fir I've taken out because it got to be about 15 feet tall and I really didn't want a tree that big. So I put in a mountain hemlock and it's doing very well now. And this is one of the only roadies that I left that was there. This is my most recent project. I'm sorry, this is fuzzy, but I had to crop it from another picture. This was the last thing I actually worked on about two years ago. It's full of Vinca minor. It used to have a Daphne that finally gave up the ghost when some people or something fell into it. So it's now sort of a mountain native area. I've got uh, mountain spirea in here, uh, low, low penstemon, some small Oregon grape, ground coverage, the uh, onion, the nodding onion, and this is this was just you know this with nothing in it. I have to water this a lot though because when I dug in the soil, I found out they must have put this back when they built the house because it's almost all sand. So it, it needs more. I wouldn't like to. Ha I don't want to water it so much, but I didn't amend the soil, and it's still so it's a lot of sand. And don't forget to mulch. I have spread, when I removed the ivy, I don't know how many truckloads of free mulch from arborists I spread around the property. I don't need it as much now, but I spread about four inches all over and it's made such a huge difference. Now I'm gonna go, do I have time to tell you real quick? This is the entry where I was. Previous owners cut all these trees and then before I arrived, this whole thing slid and they put up these ugly ecology blocks, and this is all riprap. So I asked them, because this is my entrance, if I could plant, so I planted in here. And you can see how nicely, that's the house up there, the trees have grown. But unfortunately, now that the trees are a little over 15, 20 feet, he topped all of the dug firs. I was very unhappy. And here again, you can see the same thing. It was, this was all blackberries. And now it's all natives, same area. It's all natives now. And we're back to, don't forget, you can put plants in pots. The end. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, Rita. It was so interesting to see all that you've done and looking back at the other presentations to see the same plants reappearing in different settings and contexts throughout the three different gardens. So we do have some questions. Um, we'll be going back to Clay. So Clay, can you hear me and can we hear you? Yes? Yeah, can you um, hear me? I can hear you, thank Excellent. you. Um, one question, not specifically for Clay, is can we get a PowerPoint of, well, of his presentation? Um, the whole webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website. Um, very soon, we're still working on some technical issues. So here's a question for Clay from Kyle Putnam, I believe. If you're in the early stages of garden design, any suggestions and are you starting with, you were starting with hot and dry, but 
that it will fill in and add shade. Any suggestions for navigating ground cover and herb level selections early in the game? Yeah, so I think it's important uh, to keep a couple of things in mind. First is uh, to know your plants well. So that means reading up on them, researching them, observing them as they grow in the wild. Just really get to know the native plants out there and um, what grows where. Uh, the other thing that I would um, uh, suggest is uh, pay attention to soil health. So it's, it pays many dividends to improve your soil by adding organic matter, in particular for many of our native plants uh, that are, are forest dwellers. It's important to have a healthy soil food web, and that means typically wood in the soil. So wood chips on the soil and in the soil, important. So pay attention to soil health. And then um, uh, lastly, to answer your question, I would say that it's important to keep in mind that gardens change through time. And so just like in my garden, I was gardening in hot, dry, sunny conditions. And so um, perhaps that's one of the reasons that wild ginger did not establish early in my garden is because the conditions weren't quite right. So expect your garden to change and constantly be evaluating uh, the conditions that are present, whether it might be time to introduce something or perhaps remove something that's not doing well because of changing conditions. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with Clay on that. Thank you. Um, another question for Clay was, how do you manage supplemental water? I'm not quite sure what that uh, that means. Uh, so um, uh, I used to not water at all. My objectives in the garden were to not irrigate. So I, when I first started out, I had just rock solid drought tolerant plants in the garden. And I was very proud of the fact that I didn't have to irrigate during our summer dry period. Now uh, with the dry shadier conditions, I am irrigating. I've uh, focused on uh, things that bring more color to the garden through their foliage. So things like epimediums and hostas, of course, uh, some of those require a good dose of water. So I do supplementally water those through uh, our dry summer period. But I, I would say that it's not over the top. It's fairly manageable and uh, I don't put a lot of water on the garden uh, during the summertime. Um, I'm thinking that's an answer to the question, but I'm not quite sure. So if that uh, person would like to elaborate their question, that might be useful. Okay. Um, a related question that might lead to more, more um, answer is, how do you select plants now for our Pacific Northwest rainy season that also, that also withstand increasingly hot, dry summers? Well, let me just jump in and say that um, it's not our, our wet, um, dark period, that's the limiting factor for plant growth here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it is the um, dry summer period that is the main limiting factor for um, plant growth and uh, success in a garden. So if you're going to select plants uh, to thrive here, you really want plants that are able to tolerate that summer dry condition. The amount of rain we get here in the Pacific Northwest is uh, really not notable. Um, it's mild, which allows you to grow many things from around the world. Uh, without fear of uh, killing them due to frost or other reasons. So um, think about that. Think about um, getting plants in your garden that uh, can tolerate our long, dry summers that are typical here. Good, thank you. And the same person was Sarah Barnhart wanted to know, how do you, this is for everybody, how do you manage moles or gophers? I stomp around my plants. I find sometimes like a fern is practically hanging in the air because the mole has mo gone all around it. And I just take my heel and stomp down the mole hills. I don't know what else I can do. Okay. They're surely aerating the soil. That's true. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Moles uh, this, or gophers? Uh, this, this is clear. I would say, uh, you know, moles have an important role. I know that they, um, they bioturbate, but that's an important process. And um, I, I have um, moles that just sort of come and go and they all leave their mounds. And um, after I sense that they're sort of left the garden, I, I push the mole hills down and um, it's not a big deal for me because I don't have turf. Uh, it's one of the problems with moles is if you have a lot of turf, they make mounds in your turf and that's a problem. So if you get rid of your grass, the moles aren't so bad. 
Yeah, the problem I would say though with mole tunnels is then voles and shrews also use those tunnels and those two creatures do eat plants where the moles are all carnivores. Interesting. Um, here's a question for Julia. How old are the two madronas in your rain garden? And you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. I just did. Um, I would say they're seven years old, approximately. Um, my first year, I had so many seedlings that I dug them up for the spring plant sale and potted them, and they were teeny. We sold them each for a dollar a piece. I don't know if anyone bought me. Um, you know, they're very, very hard to transplant. I've had so many come in there that I've had to take a couple out because they were too crowded, which sounds like um, such a shame to have to take one of those out, but I did. There were two growing right next to together and I wanted one to do better. Um, and my only problem I've had with them has been with mountain beaver. And they have come in and topped them repeatedly. So I've got a few that are really deformed. Um, what I ended up doing was putting some plastic guards around the bottom to keep the moles, keep the mountain beaver from topping them. I don't seem to have the mountain beaver problem right now. It's one year they took out all my corridolus. Um, which is that um, Dicentra, it's the same family as Dicentra that I showed you. So, <clears throat> yeah, I'd say about seven years. It's hard because I didn't plant them, um, but I know they're not there in the first few photos, and those were taken in 2012, so it couldn't be any more than eight years. Thank you. Um, here's a question that everybody can answer, although I think Rita already mentioned it. The question from Linda Raymond is, do you cut back any of your sword ferns? I would not recommend cutting them back. Sometimes I go in and just cut some of the, you know, some of the dead ones out when they get to be really huge and large, but they protect the soil and they have like the salamanders growing in them. Definitely don't cut them every year because those sword fronds typically last in a healthy state for about two years. And if you want to, like I said, if you want to go under and cut out some of the dead ones, that's sort of what I do too, but I would never cut them all the way back. Thank you. Um, I think this is a question for Rita. How does your wild lily of the valley do in your garden? Is it difficult to get started and is it invasive? Um, it's not too invasive. Uh, it does spread on its own and it is not difficult to start at all. And it has pretty little flowers, and then it gets berries that are sort of stripy. So it's really quite pretty. Thank you. Um, another question for Rita. What methods did you use to remove all that ivy? My hands. <laughs> Basically, if you have a section of ivy, let's say you spend 100 hours on it the first year. The next year, the same patch will take 10 hours. And the third year, you'll carry a bucket and you won't get it even full. So it's just a matter of persistence. Um, I did have some help. I, for the hillside, I did hire some people to help me do it. But most of it, I, I pulled myself. Thank you. Um, Shelley Scuderi would like to know, besides the alder, what native plant volunteers did you see coming in along the stream? Uh, alder. Douglas fir, hemlock, western red cedar, uh, some of the um, hydrophilium wandered downstream and came in on its own. The cow parsnip wandered downstream and came in on its own. I had uh, the native black uh, cap raspberry come in on its own. Uh, what else? Salmonberry. All those things sort of came in on their own in places. Thank you. Um, here's a question back for Clay uh, from Ann Cruz. How tall does the dwarf California laurel grow? I was just responding to her. Yeah, my, uh, my uh, plant is about um, 20 years old and it's about 10 feet tall. So it grows about six inches a year, about a half foot a year. So uh, in the wild, if you see it, um, 
usually it's no more than about 10 feet and often much lower than that uh, where it grows in the chaparral of California and uh, the Siskiyou Mountains of Southern Oregon. It's a great plant. Um, I would say that um, it's challenging to find in the nursery trade. Uh, it used to be sold by Colville's Creek Nursery, uh, whom I mentioned earlier, but they're out of business now. So you may need to um, look hard uh, for it and far for it, or go down to um, the Siskiyou's and collect some seed to get it on your uh, on your own. Thank you. Um, let's see. Don Huss says, thank you for sharing the challenges of starting and growing your gardens. It's nice to know I'm not alone in dealing with a lot of trial and error. Pretty sure that's the name of the game. Um, all panelists, what are your favorite pollinator plants for shade? Well, I would say Indian plum works really well for early season. Um, you know, when, they, when it, it's one of the first to bloom in my forest, I also have about a half acre forest below the house and Indian plum comes out and I do see the bees in that right away. Yeah, the Mahonias are real early too. Yeah, Mahonias and the uh, red flowering currants are excellent. Um, yeah. Ribe's uh, lobby, uh, the lob gooseberry, I noticed uh, was uh, being tended to by hummingbirds on his hummingbird this year. Yeah, I see the hummingbirds uh, going after the flowers on my vine maples. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then I have a, uh, it's not native and it's not in the shade, but a Chilean fire tree. Oh. And that I put in specifically thinking about hummingbirds. A friend of mine just gave me a, a uh, seedling from his yard from his tree and it's now 20 feet tall and just turns red with blossoms uh, a little later in the spring. So if you can get a hold of one of those and they're pretty easy to grow, let me tell you, um, and they'll, they'll sprout all over your yard because the seeds do well. Um, if you want a hummingbird tree, I think that's the one to get. It's not native, but it's, it's pretty cool. Great, thank you. Um, Rita, do you have any tips on getting rid of the grass and the blackberry? And did you intercede in the grass or just remove it? Um, one side I started, I put in the uh, water parsley and some of the carexes and some of the shrubs. Uh, the grasses, it just sort of disappeared. It wasn't, it's not sunny enough for real grass. The real grasses want a lot of sun and I just, there's, I mean, the best sun I get is on my deck and it's less than four hours. Uh, I had somebody pull one year a lot of the um, creeping buttercup and it's amazing. I, I keep after it, but it's really nowhere near as bad as it used to be. It's, it's quite manageable now. Great, thank you. A question for Julia. How did you decide on the size of your rain garden? Well, initially I <clears throat> talked with and had come out a fellow who specialized in rain gardens. I wanted to make sure that it was going to be big enough for the roof area that I was going to be dumping into it. And um, he didn't really help me all that much, but he did assure me that it, what I was planting was plenty big. And then planting the rain garden itself um, a friend of mine's a civil engineer and he laid it out for me. He basically laid it out as a rectangle and, you know, that was fine. Um, kind of an engineer's approach perhaps. And I think after the first year I added more soil and built out some areas to soften the lines and make it a little bit more rounded. Um, but it was pretty clear after the first winter that really, you know, I could have done with a rain garden maybe one-tenth the size in terms of handling the runoff. Um, there really isn't that much. Even after I added the runoff from the last, from the back side of the roof, it seemed to have absolutely no impact on what it was able to absorb. So it was, it was successful in that way. Good, thank you. I have several compliments. Thank you each so much for sharing your spaces with us. Each garden is lovely. Very inspiring, thank you so much. Each garden is so special and so much time and energy have gone into them, inspiring. Um, 
Sherry and Jim Pedrick say they also had a car, cow parsnip wander in and volunteer. Um, JL Kane would like to know if anybody has tried to grow vanilla leaf. I, I can address good. that and I've not done very well. Um, I tried to put it in under dug fur that I have in my side yard. It's just too, it was just too dry for it. And I haven't tried it down in my forest. I'd like to, but so far, no. I've put a few plants in and uh, we'll see how well they do in two different locations because I really like the vanilla leaf. Thank you. Denise would like us to remember that we provide a list of native plant and seed sources, uh, plants, bulbs, and seeds, and we update it every spring. Um, it's online on our website. Um, under on the from the homepage, go to plants and then gardening, or e email me at info dot info at wnps.org and I can help you find it. Um, M. Cameron, thanks all the presenters. It was great. Um, we will send out the link when, when the presentation is posted. It'll be a few more days. Um, so we did just talk about the native plant and seed source list, but um, Sharon Drymiller is asking where one can buy the Pacific Coast Iris. Uh, so that probably be my uh, answer. So, uh, you know, th there are just hundreds of varieties of Pacific Coast hy hybrids. Um, and you need to uh, research those varieties carefully. Some are much better than others. I would say, though, that um, most um, large and reputable nurseries will carry uh, a selection of uh, Pacific Coast hybrid irises. Um, uh, the best thing to do is find somebody that grows them and uh, befriend them and then ask for some divisions. Uh, they're just so easy to divide. And then there's also uh, Northwest, um, uh, let's see, what is it called? I'm not a member of it, but there's a, maybe an American Irish Society local chapter. And those folks um, are awash in the various cultivated forms of Pacific Coast hybrids. So it might be useful to be a member of a, a local iris society. Great, thank you. Um, Kathy Cad says, Rita, thank you for sharing. Your garden is also much like my acre property. And Larry Heil also adds his thanks. So that's all the questions and comments that I see. Um, I'd like to remind you that tomorrow, um, at 12 noon, the webinar is by Donovan Tracy, who's going to be presenting on Alpine wildflowers of Mount Rainier. And he has given this presentation to a couple of the chapters, and I've seen it, and it's wonderful and magnificent. But he wanted to make sure that we knew that he's added and changed to the presentation. So even if you've seen it before, it would be worth attending again. So um, thank you so much to our panelists. I've learned so much and I have a little tiny plot out in front of my apartment that I'm slowly filling with plants and you guys have really inspired me. Well, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, and thanks to Denise for setting this up. We appreciate it. Uh, I know you've gone through a lot of effort to do it. So thank you. Um, don't want you to be forgotten. And thank thanks you. for helping tutor me through doing this too. Thank you guys. Uh, I, it's wonderful. Well, thanks to this, all the organizers and all of the um, participants today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank okay. you. Very good. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone.